have a soft spot for propaganda. Um, and um, the guy who wrote Brave New World um, and I appear to be the only two people who uh, believe you can have good propaganda as well as bad propaganda. Good propaganda is reaching out on, with the truth and persuading the hearts and minds. And uh, so a special mention uh, to Nick Stern, who is a natural <coughs> and brilliant propagandist. And um, also to Bob Ward, who runs the communication effort. And let me say this about Bob Ward. <coughs> that the enemy, <coughs> excuse me, the enemy dread his bite and his bark. Uh, he goes after the denialists with great enthusiasm. <coughs> I have a, a brain-crushing amount of data and exhibits, and I've done this uh, a few times. And uh, as I was having dinner with a fellow environmentalist uh, last night, I thought, well, I've got to make it special. I'm, I'm going to go home and write a, a little intro. Uh, and under the uh, encouragement of two glasses of white wine, I did that. And, uh, and even though you might think you'd regret it in the morning once you've done anything, if you're me, you, you've got to use it. You've got to amortize your work. <clears throat> in the interests of... Sorry about this. <clears throat> in the interests of speed, I'll, I'll read it, uh, mostly. Um, environmentalists are always saying, whatever you do, don't frighten the audience. Don't scare them too much. But if you take a look at the data that I'm showing you today, there's a very, there is still a simple way to, to avoid scaring the audience, and that is you can lie, you can distort it, you can cherry pick. And, and that is what the oil companies and, and, and their friends in, in the UK, I call their friends the loony lords, I'm sorry, Nick. Um, and they do it very well. Lord Lawson, for example, in the last few days on Channel 4 said that the there had been no warming on the planet in the last 10 years, which isn't a bad statement when you think that 10 uh, of the last, of the warmest 11 years in history were in the last 10 years. The three warmest years in history were in the last 10 years. Why he says this, someone please explain it to me. Uh, maybe he hates his grandchildren, I have no idea. <laughs> but to deliver anything approaching the truth, of course you're going to sc scare an audience that's intelligent. As for you guys, who knows? That's a joke. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you could call this presentation the story of carbon dioxide and, uh, and homo sapiens. Without carbon dioxide, you may not know that this would be basically a frozen globe. It's minus 25 degrees centigrade. And, and only two to three hundred parts per million of carbon dioxide delivers the pleasant world that we have prospered in. Carbon dioxide also plays a, a very central role. It was the very heart through fossil fuels of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was not really based on the steam engine. It was based on, on the coal that ran the steam engine. Without coal, we would have very quickly had what I think of as, as the great forest wars of the 19th century, where the demand for wood to fuel steam engines <clears throat> to generate power would quickly have denuded all the great forests of the world. And then we would have been back to where we were at the time of Malthus, living at the edge of our capability with recurrent waves, particularly in Eastern Europe, of, of famine, uh, as every other creature on the planet does. Good, good years, you advance. Bad years, uh, you fall off. A gallon of gasoline has about 400, or petrol to you, has about 400 hours of labor equivalent. It's just massive. It means that ordinary middle class people have the power that only kings would have had typically in the distant past. And what that has done, that incredible gift of accumulated power over millions of years has catapulted us forward in terms of civilization, in terms of culture, science. It created uh, an enormous surplus with which we could do these things for the first time in history, and above all, agriculture, particularly through the 
man-made manufacture of nitrogen without which you can't grow anything, uh, it allowed the population to surge forward. The sting in the tail is that this has left us with seven and a half going on 12 billion. And that is only maintainable by continued heavy use of fossil fuels, which will either run out or destroy the planet or both. With the only possible exception, the only possible way out is rapid and complete decarbonization. And needless to say, this is an extremely difficult thing to pull off and extremely expensive in the long run. If it depended on our good sense, if we, for example, had to decide in our long-term interest to take 5 or 10 percent of our GDP as if we were fighting a great war, uh, we would be toasted. There is no way we would voluntarily pay such a high price to save our long-term bacon. But technology, particularly the technology of decarbonization, has come leaping uh, to uh, help us. Uh, this is the race of our lives. And technology, in my opinion, will in one sense win. When we come back in 40 years, I am pretty confident there will be a decent sufficiency of cheap energy on the planet that does not involve carbon, and in 80 years, perhaps, uh, it's likely we will have uh, full decarbonization. If only that were the end of the story. The truth is that we have moved so late that by the time we reach a new stability of plus two to three degrees centigrade, a lot of damage will have been done and a lot more will happen in the future uh, due to inertia in the following one or 200 years uh, when we stop producing a single uh, particle of CO2, uh, the damage grinds on. <clears throat> First, the sea level rise. I don't worry too much about the Miamis and the Bostons. Uh, that's just a, a kind of thing that capitalism tends to handle pretty well. The serious problem is the loss of the great grain-producing deltas around the world. The Nile, the Mekong, Bangladesh, Thailand, these produce probably 10% of the world's grain supply. Agriculture is in fact the real underlying problem produced by climate change. For even without climate change, it would be somewhere between hard to impossible to feed 12 billion people, which is the UN forecast for 2100, especially difficult in Africa. With climate change, there are two separate effects on agriculture. One is immediate. The droughts, the floods, the increased temperature reduce quite measurably and, and materially uh, the productivity of that year's harvest. And then there's the delayed effect. The most dependable outcome of climate change is an increase in heavy downpours. It is precisely the heavy downpours that cause erosion. And erosion is the great untalked about problem. We're losing 1% a year of our collective global soil. It's calculated that there are 30 to 70 good crop years left, depending on the location. In uh, 80 years, current agriculture is simply infeasible uh, for lack of good soil. A separate, a separate threat, also closely related to fossil fuels, is that we created a toxic environment not conducive to life uh, from insects to humans, as we'll see. And we must respond rapidly by a massive and urgent move away from the use of complicated chemicals uh, that uh, sat saturate our daily life. Finally, uh, in terms of the introduction, a subtext to all this is that capitalism and mainstream economics simply can't apparently deal with these problems. Mainstream economics largely ignores natural capital. I exempt LSE, of course, uh, but it's absolutely true otherwise. The idea that a true Hicksian profit requires that capital base be left completely intact and only the excess is a true profit. And of course, we have not left our natural capital base intact or anything like it. The replacement cost of copper and oil and so on, we don't attempt to replace them. Capitalism also has a severe problem with very long term because of the tyranny of the discount rate. Anything that happens to a corporation over 25 years out it, it doesn't exist. Uh, for them, therefore, grandchildren have no value. 
They handle very badly externalities. Even handle badly is flattering. They don't handle at all. It is completely ignored in the tragedies of the commons. Indeed, they're made worse by deliberate, well-funded and talented uh, programs for obfuscation, particularly in the US, but also, sadly, in the UK. So now for the, uh, now for the data. The race of our lives, climate damage accelerates. Here we have the exhibit that Al Gore made famous, 400,000 years of carbon dioxide. At the bottom of the ice ages, you see four there. There was 180 parts per million at the, at the uh, interglacials, of which there are four and a half, um, you see it, it, it rose to 280, 300 parts. So 120, 100 to 120 parts per million, for heaven's sake, made the difference between two miles of ice on Manhattan and what we have today. The ability of a carbon dioxide molecule to trap heat is, is amazingly impressive. 1950, we were up in the general area where you might have expected the beginning of a several thousand year down leg into another ice age uh, when we pulled this stunt. We added an extra 120 parts per million. We added as much carbon dioxide as the complete amount that separates the bottom of an ice age from an interglacial. And in a blink of an eye, we've added that much. And we will add the same amount again, another 120. It is a massive experiment and the best word to describe it is feckless. We, we are absolutely lacking in feck. The, um, I had a hard time with the climate scientists using the word acceleration. I, I'm proud to say I did this one four years ago. It's only in the last year that climate science has taken to using the word acceleration at a, at fairly regularly in peer-reviewed articles. Good for them. Uh, I, I think Trump has at least got one purpose in life. He's put a little more backbone in, into, uh, into climate scientists. The, uh, four years ago, I did this one, which just looked at the very modest increase in the first 50 years of the last century and the second 50 years. And then between the two El Ninos, which cause a local surge in, in heat uh, from the 1998 peak to the 16 peak, 25 bips, 7, 15, 25. This is pretty impressive acceleration. And there's something about a bad item accelerating that should make the hairs on the back of one's neck prickle a bit. And the ocean temperature is, of course, also accelerating. The black line is down to 2,000 meters. And uh, on the right, you see that 1950 to 90, 37 units of heat increase a year. And in the last 26 years, the last few minutes, it's accelerated to 99 units. The most rapid acceleration of all, though, was released recently, an estimate that the melting of Antarctica, previously considered almost off limits, um, seems to be doubling every 20 years, at least according to one group of well-qualified scientists. The consequences, most dependable, as I said, is the downpour. This is just the incidence of uh, one, one inch a day, uh, which is a modest definition of a downpour. In Houston, they had 10 inches in one day, followed by 10 inches, followed by 10 inches. It wasn't just a 100-year flood they had last year. It was off the record, a 1,000 years, you could say, or impossible. Both of them work pretty well, statistically. The bad news was 18 months before that, they had had what would have been a 100-year flood, and 18 months, less than 18 months before that, they'd had a 50 to 100-year flood. Um, the data simply no longer computes on the old numbers. The serious widespread consequences, the flood damage here uh, on the left, and then the droughts on the right, the wildfires and the extreme temperature events, this does not include the dreadful California wildfires fires or Houston. But greener technologies also accelerate. The cavalry 
racing to the edge of the cliff before we throw ourselves off is my, is my view of this, and maybe they will get there first and maybe they won't. I used to think the odds were about 50-50, I think maybe a little less now. We, we seem to have lost a ground in the last three years. This is the best, some of the best news we could possibly read about. This was a uh, telephone uh, talk with stockholders from the largest utility company in North America uh, that, has, uh, that owns uh, Florida Power and Light. It also owns the largest trader of wind and solar. And what he's saying here is that without incentives, early in the next decade, wind is going to be two pennies to three pennies per kilowatt hour, and battery storage will be a penny on top of that. And he's saying, kind of pay attention here, what this means is that the full levelized cost, the full cost of building a solar and a wind farm and operating it will be less than the marginal cost, than the operating cost of his best nuclear plant and his best coal plant. And this is not from a friend. This is from the dark side. This is, this is someone uh, who uh, makes money at building uh, electric plants. He knows what he's talking about. And as if that wasn't good enough news, because that says the game is over. It's all over by the shouting in terms of, of electricity. We had substantially more recently in the last two months a proposal for, in Colorado for XL Corporation. They were thinking of closing a couple of, of coal plants early. They sent out for proposals. They were overwhelmed with 850. 350 of them were for wind and solar, including storage. Uh, of we deduce about four to six hours of storage to get the evening kicker. And the median price, below which half of them, uh, half of them were lower, uh, 2.1 pennies for wind plus storage. So that's already leapt 30% beyond what the previous guy was talking about and just in a few months. That's how fast it's moving. And, and solar, 3.6 pennies, uh, including storage. And the storage bids here were 0.3 pennies to 0.7. The previous guy had been talking about a penny, and a few months later, they come in with real bids for 2023 of 0.3 to 0.7. It really is amazing progress. Hasn't been fully digested yet uh, in, in America, and probably not here. And this is what it looks like. This is starting in 2009, for heaven's sake, a few minutes ago, and look at the speed with which solar has been coming down to 50 bucks, five cents a kilowatt hour, and, and onshore wind uh, below that, and, and these are not up there with what we just talked about, but that is the median coal plant. So all you have to do is go back 10 years, and this was a gleam in the eye. In fact, no one was suggesting it would have happened, and now we have not just passed through that point, but we have absolutely trashed it. Just a word on wind, which people don't understand that well. In 2000, uh, that's a, on the right, there's a pretty decent sized two megawatt turbine. Most of the ones you cycle past, even in Holland, are as, no bigger than that and mostly smaller. That is a big windmill by what we are used to seeing. Uh, in Boston, we have nothing as close to as big as that. And... Um, over on the left, you have a monster, a 10 megawatt, which has now been put up and is operating two years ahead of schedule, the uh, biggest one uh, in, in the UK. And uh, one, two, three, four weeks ago on Monday, um, GE announced that for 2022 orders, you can have a 12 megawatt. Let me tell you about the 12 megawatt machine. It is 260 meters high. I mean, it would take you half an hour to run the distance of these things. The blade, a single blade, is 107 meters tall. The total, therefore, 367 meters, much higher uh, than the Eiffel Tower. And, I, and we had lunch, my wife and me, uh, on the top of the Eiffel Tower quite recently. It is very big. <laughs> it, it is sitting there, just shocking to imagine a wind blade turning around uh, over your head. Um, now, how do these things work? 
the energy they generate is, is equal to the area they, they sweep. So when you go from a 10-foot blade to 20, you don't double your power, you quadruple it, courtesy of pi r squared. So you square it, uh, which is the bigger the better. But the thing that is much more powerful than that even is picking good wind. And one of the things you get when you go up to the top of the Eiffel Tower is you get windier. And wind does not go up when you go from 10 miles an hour wind to 20. It doesn't just double. It doesn't just quadruple. It octuples. And that is why a hurricane at 140 miles an hour is not merely irritatingly more powerful than 120. It's 70 percent more powerful than 120 mile an hour wind. When you go up high, you pick up about 20% increased wind, which means 70% more power, so we're very, very tall. So you build these giant monsters for the North Sea, you assemble them on the coast, you stick them on a special boat, you take them out, they assemble it directly. The, the, the ones they have now, they do in 10 hours, down from three days. And as they become even more monstrous, my guess is in 30, 40 years, the cheapest power in the world will be the largest wind powers, which by then might be 30 or even 40 megawatts. 20,000 homes even from a 12 megawatt. And everybody said, ah yes, but the weak sister here is batteries. And it was true. Batteries did not even increase at 3% a year for the 50 years leading to 2010. And just about the time it became a cliche, which so often happens, the reality changed. From In 2010, Tesla could do you a, a thousand megawatts, and um, I'm sorry, a megawatt for a thousand dollars, and uh, this year it will be 150. It's dropped 85 percent in eight years, and when they're making 30 million electric cars, it will be half that. The Grantham Foundation happily is investing in, in the next generation of lithium ion, which is solid state, will not burst into flame, charges in five minutes, and uses half the material and therefore half the weight and half the volume. So it won't just go from 150 to 75 at scale, at scale the next generation, and if we don't get it, uh, uh, Dyson and the boys will get it there also uh, on, on the target. Uh, it will be not 75, but 40. That will make an electric car far cheaper to build than internal combustion, infinitely cheaper to run, which it already is, and with 15% of the moving parts, much cheaper to maintain. This is a done deal. And uh, there's a consulting firm who've been around for over 100 years in, in Norway and uh, advising oil companies and more recently uh, renewable companies, uh, generally considered pretty arm's length. And they have pretty aggressive assumptions, as, as I do. If you follow the data, you realize things are moving along very well. They put that into their models, and this is what they get. They get uh, oil and fossil fuels peaking pretty soon, but the bad news is by 2050, it's still 50% of all the power is coming from fossil fuels, even if you believe what I have told you about electrification and, and uh, electric cars, which is a pretty scary thought because it gives you this. Fossil fuel use, even if it peaks out, which it will, maybe not uh, 2020, but maybe before 2030, uh, but still the carbon emissions will continue to rise. And on our best estimates, and, and, and theirs really, um, you get to almost two degrees by 2050 and half the power is still fossil fuels. You can see how easily we're going to end up. How easy it is to get to three degrees. We're going to have to fight and kick and scream to keep it at two and a half. Um, this, of course, is just a massive... This is the biggest movement since fossil fuels came in, since the carbonization of the global economy and the Industrial Revolution. This is the next biggest wave to decarbonize or, or, or die in the attempt, or bust. Okay, if that wasn't bad enough, now the terrible news. Uh, feeding the 12 billion, the impact on food sufficiency of population growth and increasing wealth, uh, climate change and soil erosion, and many related factors. So this is the population. It's chugging along, going nowhere, 
when Malthus writes his piece, it's uh, one and a half billion. When I'm born, it's 2.2, and now it's seven and a half. For God's sake, it's tripled in my lifetime. Are we serious? I mean, if that's the curve in the stock market, you know what to do. Panic, go short, right? <laughs> and they are the official UN forecast, high to low, 12 billion uh, to, uh, sorry, 16 billion to 8 billion with 12 uh, is merely the middle of their forecast. I would say, of course, it's not going to happen. I know now enough about agriculture to know there is no way we're getting to 16 billion and probably no way we're getting to 12. Our last best hope is that the fertility rate around the world drops. And in the developed world, it's dropped more than people realize. Uh, 2.1 dotted line is replacement cost and everybody in the developed world is now below. And given the cultural trends, it looks like it's going to stay there. Um, and we have some wonderful cases in, in the developing world. This is Iran, obviously a Muslim country, got some help from oil, but they had seven children per woman in 1961, and now they have 1.6. I mean, what an achievement. And you could dismiss it, well, they've got a lot of money, but uh, my favorite one of all really is Bangladesh, also coming from seven children per woman to 2.2. They are dirt poor, they are cheaper, uh, they are poorer than Nigerians. Uh, and yet they've managed by persistent government effort, training local women, going out, persistently talking to the villagers and the townsfolk, they have gotten it down. They've also uh, gotten down, by the way, um, the incidence of uh, diarrhea and, uh, and uh, dysentery and uh, child mortality and stunting to almost nothing, uh, to 10% of what it was uh, 15, 20 years ago. And half of India, uh, which is twice, <laughs> twice as rich as they are. So this is, this is the problem. It's Africa. The official forecast of the UN is virtually all of the increase we're looking at is, is, is in Africa. The rest of the world is half a billion. Africa is 3.3 billion, six and a half times more than the rest of the world combined. Nigeria alone is more than the rest of the world at 600 million. The official forecast, believe it or not, is they, they think the middle range forecast for Nigeria is they'll have 800 million people by 2100. They had 28 million when I was born. They have 190 today. And uh, they're not entirely comfortable feeding the people they have uh, as it is. In a recent poll, they were asked, do you want to emigrate? 40% said yes, mostly to the UK. Well, that works out pretty well. 40% of 800 million, we could squeeze in 320 million <laughs> if we were feeling generous. Um, and just to rub in that point, there is no way Europe can handle any, any material number of African food refugees that are likely, in my opinion, uh, to be... A, offered to the marketplace, if you will. If we took 100 million, it would hardly be a down payment on the kind of problem that they will have over the next 60, 70 years. And because it is absolutely impossible for us to do justice in any way to their problem, um, we should recognize that, in fact, attempting to do it in a half-baked manner will be very self-destructive to the social harmony of, uh, of Europe. I'm kind of sad to have written four years ago that the first casualty I thought of African problems would be the liberal traditions of Europe. Little did I know how fast that would move and how uh, dramatically it would stimulate the, the right wing. If you try to do the impossible on this one, you will end up with a lot of right wing uh, uh, reflex. Um, you just have to work out a reasonably fair, clear way of saying no. You cannot take food, genuine food refugees. It will not be doable. I am left of Karl Marx, by the way, on income inequality, just to let you know that I have no fascist leanings that I'm aware of. This is the total demand for food as calculated, uh, no, as in the past. Uh, there's something relentlessly smooth about that, which is terrifying. And this is uh, the crop yields 
starting in the, the end of the Green Revolution, which ran from about 1960 to 71, 3.5%, amazing, just think about it. Every three years you have a 10% increase in output from a given field. Ah, incredible. Uh, mainly through um, sturdier crops designed to handle masses of fertilizer combined with the masses of fertilizer. And not surprisingly, irregularly that has declined to 1.1, which is exactly the rate of population growth. We are now capable of increasing our yield of grain, which is the heavy lifter of calories, 80%, uh, at the same rate we're increasing uh, our population. There is no safety margin. And then we get into uh, the economist stuff of diminishing marginal returns. Now, if you're going to look for diminishing returns in grain production, where are you going to look? You're going to look at the people who do the very, very best, right? That's where you expect to see it soonest. And these are the people who grow wheat the very best per acre. It is not the U.S. They do the best per person, one farmer and his son and 6,000 acres. But we do much better in Europe per acre and in Japan for rice. These are the best producing countries for grain, and they have not increased their productivity for 15 years, even though they had pretty steadily for the prior 100, 100 years. And this is one of the reasons the great surge of fertilizer that started after World War II um, and, and uh, more or less maxed out about 88. And now the U.S. and China in particular clearly use a little more uh, than is optimal. And some countries, particularly in Africa, could benefit, but the great surge is behind us. So this is my attempt to look at the marginal returns, the productivity of grain. 1930 to 50, you're chugging along at a fairly handsome 1.5. The Green Revolution, for 20 years, kicks it up to 3.5, and then it bounces back to 1.5. But in the last 20 years, it drops another half point to 1, and we estimate the following 20 years, it will drop just a quarter of a point uh, to 0.75. And this is an exhibit that shows the top dotted line is the extrapolation that people use, typically. And, uh, and the effect of the erosion, uh, which starts off fairly modest at 10% uh, and, uh, and then becomes much bigger, almost geometrically big, bigger as you go out in the following 40 years. Uh, we've added a little green line, which is actually minus 13, which is the impact of in increased flooding on erosion. Let me tell you something about science, by the way. People work in silos. There is a report we're coming to on climate change effect on agriculture. It does not mention the word erosion. Okay, you have my personal guarantee. These are climate scientists, and the other guys with their feet in the mud are erosion scientists, and they do not talk, apparently. So we called out the erosion guys, and they said, as far as they were aware, they were not particularly concerned about climate change, even though a huge increase in heavy floods is a guarantee. There's a peer-reviewed paper that said that the English summer, God bless it, by 2100 would have four times the intense downpours that it has today. Just what the English summer needs, apparently. <laughs> this, this drizzle, drizzle stuff gets on your nerves. Let's have some serious rain. <laughs> Erosion is a power law. Um, 95% of the time, even a heavy, heavy rain has no effect. The farmers are not stupid. They don't lose soil that easily. But it's the two or three real downpours a year, the one or two every two or three years, the monsters that cause the gullies that are 10 feet deep in, in Iowa. And uh, it's that kind of rain that's, that's coming and has been coming in these last few years, notoriously, and will increase. And this is a, a, a county in Iowa, this is really absolutely mind-blowing for me. Uh, 1850, they had 14 inches. Now, you need three to four inches of good soil. We were having dinner with a soil scientist, I'm sorry, with, with a, a, a farmer in, in renewable farming last night. And she said three to four inches uh, is what you need. They had 14 inches. They had a magnificent excess. And 1900, 11 and a half, 1950, 9.5, 7 in 1975, 5.5 in 2000, 
they had apparently stopped at that. And so we called them up, tracked them down, and got the latest number. The good news is the erosion has reduced by more than 50%. They are getting worried, and, uh, but it's 4.8 is the bad news. Now, 4.8 is still really nice sufficiency, but you can imagine looking at that with another one at 4.8 when you need three to four that you're about time to get scared. But there is no, there is no scared in this business. No one seems even slightly interested in this point. So, one of the two most dreadful reports I have ever read came out, unfortunately, from it was in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, generally recognized as number three. Um, when they're this dangerous, you want them to be in the 400th uh, journal. Liang and about 10 others, which is increasingly the pattern, uh, they were looking, what they did is they went back over 50 years and they looked at the actual effect that a flood had in an area in the US. What did a flood do in Iowa? What did a drought do in Montana? And so on. And, and did, did the heat have any effect? At the moment, almost none, but in the future, quite a bit. And then they extrapolated according to the mid-range forecast for floods and droughts. And just used the effects and, and built in the increasing severity and they came to this conclusion that it would be 47% less than just extrapolating the existing productivity. It would take it back to the productivity levels of 1980. There was a follow-up report peer-reviewed on France and French wheat, very similar conclusions. If this represents the world, we will not be able, under current agricultural techniques, to maintain stable society as we know it, and Africa in particular will, will have incredible problems. You've never seen an exhibit like this because there's never been one because the erosion people don't talk to the other guys. But this is putting in one by one erosion, the increased effect of heavy downpours and, and so on. And finally we decided, okay, we'll give, we'll give that great study by Liang and the boys, we'll give them a one-third debit because their study said everything else being even and the world will not stay still. It will change its crops, it will put an uh, arm and a leg into trying to get uh, more drought resistant, flood resistant grains. So we gave them a one third credit on their damage and uh, it's a 56% collective reduction in what other people appear to assume will be the case and a 38% reduction from today. This better be wrong. I don't know why it's wrong, but it better be wrong. Other problems facing big ag, water availability, urban expansion, bug and pathogen immunity, the weeds are becoming a terrible problem. Do you know there is as much loss to the typical crop in the US today as there was in 1945 before we started our chemical warfare? You can't now give it up because you've trained those weeds to grow like weeds, pardon the expression, and they would come screaming back and ruin your crop. Uh, but if you could go back in a time machine and not change it, it does appear that we have not gained much ground by spending so much money on, 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 on chemicals. Toxic environment, 75% loss of flying insects. This is the second of my two horror stories. Most of you by now have probably picked this up. Um, it was done by German serious amateurs uh, who uh, had a, a passionate attachment to insects who knew there were such people. But, uh, in Germany, they went out assiduously, I'm married to a German, I can say, with Teutonic efficiency. And every, the same night in the summer, every year in the same place, they put up the same net and caught everything that flew into that net. And they measured it from 1989. They did it several times in forest preserves of one of the big uh, provinces in, in uh, Germany. And what happened? Since 89, which 28 years ago, 75% of the flying insects have disappeared. 75% of the sheer mass of all those insects. It does appear that this is a toxic environment that is simply not conducive to life. And uh, the real trouble here is there's incredible doubt. No one knows 
what is causing it. And let me ask you a question. Who will get the benefit of the doubt? Will they ban the chemicals to give the benefit of the doubt to Homo sapiens, or will they not ban them to give the benefit of the doubt to the chemical companies? Do not hold your breath. I will guarantee that at least for the first few years, until this becomes a flashpoint, they will give the benefit of the doubt to the chemical companies, and we must hammer them on this issue. I do believe this issue will catch fire and overtake climate change. There is something more personal about what is happening to the insects, the butterflies, the bees, and the humans. <clears throat> Let me just say global distribution of phosphate reserves. You cannot, <clears throat> you cannot grow any living thing without phosphorus and potassium. And, uh, and this is the problem. Um, we mine phosphorus and we mine potassium. They are finite reserves. And phosphorus is a particularly finite reserve. A recent report said it re reduces the chance of life out in the universe because there is a universal shortage of, of phosphorus. And if life there was to be based like life is here, the lack of phosphorus would be a huge uh, uh, hindrance. And uh, we have a lot of phosphorus, but the bad news is 75%, plus or minus 10, is in Morocco and the Western Sahara. So when you see ISIS take over Morocco, you have my personal guarantee that within a week, the US military, the Chinese military, and maybe the European military will be in there. We cannot afford, we only have 50 years with no growth outside Morocco. And with growth, 35 years. And at 35 years on something you need to live in an agriculture based on mining it, shipping it, and pouring it in millions of tons over the fields. You need to go to sustainable agriculture, and that takes decades of change, and farmers, like fishermen, are extremely conservative. Okay, climate change, the problems with capitalism. We have the sixth uh, great extinction going on, uh, but no uh, response, no calculation of the costs uh, in, in, in mainstream economics. Toxicity, um, I'm sorry, the, the, the heading for this one is wrong. It doesn't matter. Toxicity affecting humans also. A 50% loss in the developed world and the sperm count of us humans. I mean, give me a break. Who is worried about this? This was a, a meta study of almost 200 surveys. This is not trivial data. Are you going to panic at 75% reduction? How about 87 and a half? Uh, I mean, we're like the flying damned insects. I mean, we're on our way out, and the same reason, unspecified toxicity, which we do not quite know what is causing what. Is it the Teflon in the bottom of your pan? Is it the plastic wrap around your food? Is it the stuff in the air from diesel cars? Is it all of the above? Uh, we don't know. All we know is the consequence. Complete inability of capitalism to deal with these things. Let me tell you the story of the devil and the farmer. So the devil goes out to a Midwestern farmer, and he offers them a deal. I will guarantee you, for your soul, um, three times the profit uh, on your wheat and your corn and everything else if you sign the contract for your soul and all the other clauses. And clause 21 is it will cost them 1% of their soil as well as their soul. And 1% uh, is exactly what they're losing anyway, so that was pretty easy. So they sign up. And, uh, of course, they make a killing and his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren. The present value of that deal is 5.5 million, and the no-deal farmers up the road who decided to tough it out and keep their soul uh, is 2 million. Now, this is the bad news. That's 100 years, of course, you've lost all your soil, and uh, as I like to say, at least when the starving people arrive from Chicago, uh, the farmer dies rich. Um, you cannot feed the people with no soil. And the devil has conned you into doing it. But this is the bad news. Every MBA ever generated is going to sign that damn contract or, or flunk the course. I mean, this is a dramatically profitable deal we're engaged in. Stephen Pinker and the boys who say, say everything is wonderful. This is the point. Everything is wonderful because we're not accounting for sustainability. And the old joke about so far so good as you fall through the Empire State Building. 
So far, so good. So far, so good. 16 inches of soil, 12 inches, 8 inches. So far, so good. Uh, we're just running through the system. This is a, an illustrative climate change portfolio, the kind of portfolio that you investors will need to get your brains around. It has, I can barely read it here, it has 34% clean energy, 10% solar, 6% wind, clean power generation, smart grid, copper. You need five times more copper for all things electric than you do internal combustion. Energy efficiency, 20, a bottomless pit of opportunities to make money. Uh, and agriculture, 23%. Agriculture is the key. And third generation high-tech agriculture is my favorite investment. The Grantham Foundation has 50% venture capital, fairly early stage, unique in the <coughs> foundation business. And a lot of it is aimed at agriculture. And finally, the peril of divestment. Uh, I have met more investment committees uh, than I care to think about. <coughs> Perhaps a couple of thousand, I would think, by now. Uh, and there's no more conservative group on the planet than an investment committee. And if you tell an investment committee, if you cough at an investment committee, they think they're ruined. If you tell them you're going to take out anything from their portfolio, interfere in any way, they'll say that it's doomed to the long-term result. And, uh, and certainly if you took out something uh, like uh, utilities or energy or fossil fuels, uh, it would be incredibly destructive, so it is said. So finally, we did the test. We took out each of 10 major groups and ran consistently with the remaining 90. And the first time I did this, we did it from 1989. And you will see how dramatically they vary on the top row. <laughs> There's 50 basis points difference between the best and the worst. They're all the same. And when I saw this, I thought, oh my God, we picked an incredible year, but what the hell? And I went ahead being unscrupulous and presented the data. And my conscience finally got the better of me, so we went back and we tracked it. But just before we look at that, <clears throat> look what happened to tech. That is the little unique little outlier on the downside as the tech bubble formed and broke. And then it got back as if it had never happened. All of those 10 lines track across as if they were the same. And then we extended it, first of all to 1957, and, and, and secondly to 1925. And yes, of course, it ruins the whole thing. It has now gone from 50 bips to 54 bips. So uh, 90 years it has not cost you. Who knew the market has found something it is efficient at? It may be hopeless in bubbles and busts, but it can tell you uh, that it's priced these big groups pretty well. There is no free lunch in buying high-growth technology over low-growth, boring, dopey uh, uh, utilities. They have priced the utilities down and the tech up, and they do indeed do it right, and they produce the same returns. This is amazing. What does this mean for divestment? It means that if you go in there and you take out fossil fuels, your starting assumption is not death and destruction. Your starting assumption, until proven otherwise, is that it will have very little effect and is just as likely to be positive by 17 bips as negative. And that's an amazing contradiction to what every investment committee has ever said, as far as I'm concerned. But things are not the same because... It obviously takes a major miscalculation to move the dial here. Nothing like that has happened for 90 years. But I do think that decarbonization is just such an event. And the reason I think that is the oil companies, the chemical companies, are not rolling with the punches. They are fighting it tooth and nail. They are still funding obfuscation programs in, in North America. And if you do that as a corporation, as a capitalist, you are likely to bite the dust if you're facing a major change, if you fight it. And they are fighting it. If they rolled with the punches, they might do quite well uh, and, and, and bleed off their capital and pay big dividends, but they are not doing that. And uh, there is not a fallback to chemicals, and that's what you'll hear. Oh, yes, maybe we'll lose our gasoline market, but we'll fall back on petrochemical feedstock. Oh, no, they won't. My guess is that petrochemical will be having more suits in 20 years than they have. And they're already facing 50 to 100 suits 
that they have misrepresented the oil company's products. In, in the old days of the 1970s, they had peer-reviewed articles by Exxon scientists saying how dangerous carbon dioxide was. They had a very expensive ocean-going ship taking data. And then in 1982, a new guy comes in, fires them all, except the two scientists who turn, coat, who turn their coats and cranked out stuff for, for the denialists. And um, they have misrepresented their products and, and should pay a high price. And if I were you as investors, uh, I would make sure if you have a long-range horizon, you absolutely categorically avoid chemicals as well as absolutely avoiding uh, fossil fuel companies. They face a headwind. And uh, climate change companies will be difficult. They will have overexpansion, but they will have a tailwind of more rapid uh, growth, for sure, which never hurts. Thank you. We've got um, just about 20 minutes, just a more, on, um, for questions. There's lots here. And uh, I, I should remind you the LSE tradition of uh, gender balance in, uh, in questions. We don't always achieve it, but um, I just note it. The lady just here. Hi, and Laura could you keep them short? Send, because there are yes. lots of people who are trying to. Yes, Centre for Multilateral Negotiations. Um, I've got a question. What role do you think regulation should play? You talked a lot about um, science and, and business, and if at all, and how to make it effective. I don't, I, I, I don't think capitalism works at all well without regulation. If you count on a capitalist doing anything other than maximizing his short-term profits, um, you'll make a bad bet. Don't hold your breath. There are one or two altruists in the capitalist world. Marks and Spencer is pretty good. Unilever is very good. But in general, they're answering to stockholders who are pounding the table, maximize your short-term profits, get the stock price up. Um, Capitalists do not work on these issues. They are not going to solve the problems unless regulations insist. They will strip mine and have the acid run down the streams of West Virginia. Those regulations have been taken off now by, by Trump. It's quite iniquitous. And, and never count on them to do any of this. So regulations and regulations are the only way you can run a capitalist society and live to tell the tale. Thank you. Gentleman just here. Thank you. Uh, Julian O'Halloran, writer and broadcaster. Uh, the first time I saw you speak at UCL a few years ago, you did weigh in on this point about soil erosion, uh, and you have linked the dangers of soil erosion with climate change and heavy downpours. To what extent do you think is this issue being better understood in the States, where you do tend to get more extreme weather, than in this country. I haven't seen it really written about much, the honourable exception maybe of The Guardian uh, once or twice. Do you think there is a, a, a gulf, a gap, between our knowledge and assessment of this issue uh, in Britain compared with... Sa North sadly, America? no. It, um, it's ignored um, perhaps even more comprehensively. I, I think there, there is an honourable tradition of more agricultural research uh, and, and more con connection between that and, and the general public uh, than there is in the U.S. They know nothing about it. Um, right at the back there. That's Joe. Um, thank you. Um, Joe Haig from <coughs> Grantham Institute at Imperial College. Thank you for a, a wonderful talk, Jeremy. Um, you talk a lot about um, fuels, obviously, and um, also about climate change. Um, and also um, food. Now, one thing that's going to be a sort of across those areas is the issue of biofuels. And you didn't say much about biofuels, and I wonder if you have an opinion on those. The, the, the trouble about biofuels in general is that it competes with uh, the ability to grow regular food. And since I think that the growing of regular food is an overwhelming problem, um, it's hard to squeeze biofuel into that equation. So I think, in general, land-based biofuel is a bit of a red herring. I think ocean-based biofuel is, is a quite interesting possibility. Growing seaweed, which outgrows land-based plants four to one, the best, so outgrows e even the sugar cane and so on, uh, that's a possibility that the Grantham Foundation is looking at quite seriously. But I think land-based is a very temporary thing and will eventually 
be driven out of business by the need to grow food. Uh, could I just emphasise, thank you Joe, that, that was Joe Hay, a very distinguished physicist from Imperial College and director of our sister institute, the Grantham Institute. At, uh, right. um, a gentleman over there, please. And shout at me, because I'm apparently going a bit deaf. Hello, Jeremy. Peter Hi. Wheeler from the Nature Conservancy. Um, I was surprised in your model portfolio that you only had 1.7% in timber or forestry, given that, you know, as by our analysis, to get to 2030 on the track we need to be on for a two-degree world, we need to grow a lot more trees, and to grow trees, you've got to use them and sequester the carbon in perpetuity. So, query, why is the forestry timber industry such a small weighting in your portfolio? The... Um that suggested portfolio had only one objective, and that was to understand the forces of climate change and to make money. It was a capitalist take on, uh, it wasn't a do-gooders take on it. Uh, yes, of course, you could have a lot more timber. The fact is that timber, like every other asset on the planet, has been pushed up in price and down in yield by the long-term existence of zero return on cash, et cetera, et cetera. And the yield in New England has gone from seven to four and a half. The yield on an Iowa farm has gone from five to three. It's simply not that attractive to be blunt in capitalist terms. The other thing in sequestering terms, you can't get enough leverage out of lower deforestation and increased reforestation uh, to really get the job done in any material way. If in 10 years we were zero, on that equation, we would be doing well. We've got to do something much more scalable, much more rapid and dramatic than that. Although, please, let's do the best we can on that. Increase the soil, the carbon content, increase the quality of our farming is multiples of that, but still not, not enough to solve the problem. We are going to have to start sucking carbon dioxide out of the air chemically, bio, biologically, uh, uh, or physically. And... Um, biologically would be the best way, and we've got to find a way to do that. Uh, and the current methodologies are too slow. Thank you. Um, right at the back there, please. Hi, thank you, Jeremy. Going back to ag technology, it's 50% of your portfolio that you've mentioned. I'm just curious, what sort of technologies are you excited by? And is vertical farming one of those? No, no, vertical farming is only useful for cities to grow high-priced uh, crops, elegant veggies for Michelin-starred restaurants. It, it, and it makes good sense, and you can make good money. In terms of calorie heavy lifting, forget it. You need millions and millions of acres, and to do that, you need good soil, etc. Oh, sorry, I didn't answer your question. But, Third generation technologies, I bumped into a really exciting one recently, where they look at the kind of biome of the plant, the microorganisms inside the plant, and they extract them using a technology unavailable five years ago, and they grow plants with each single microorganism to see what effect it has. And they collect those that do a good job for drought and, and flood and growth, efficient processing of, of, of carbon and so on, and, uh, and then they coat the seed. And, and um, with cotton, they have a double-digit increase in, in productivity. It's a very promising kind of third-generation attack. Happy to say Grantham Foundation has a small holding. A gentleman just there. Paul Dickinson, CDP. Um, Jeremy, thank you so much. Uh, if we look at the systemic problem, we need regulation uh, and the price mechanism to change behavior. Would you agree, potentially, that the most useful thing institutional investors can do is to collaborate to get money out of politics? That, I don't know if it's the number one. It's dramatically important. Uh, the U.S., in particular, to a degree you wouldn't understand, is run by... Uh, the capitalist system, the very rich people and the corporations. There's something called the Gillen's flat line. 
31% of all bills go through Congress, and if the general public love it, it goes to 32. If they hate it, it goes to 30, hence the flat line. If the ultra-rich love it, it goes to 65. They aren't imperfect. But if they hate it, it goes to nil. Nothing gets done in America unless the elite approve. Representative democracy has ceased to exist. And, and, and breaking that hold, which we have to do, is the top of the list for America. Uh, I might put it in the top three uh, uh, in the rest of the world. Is the lady just there? Uh, sorry, uh, just, just, just here, second row. There was a hand over there, it's gone away. But lady just here, yeah. Hi, I'm Ashley from Climate Kick Australia. My question is on the circular economy and the role you feel it may play in addressing some of these crises around climate, climate change. I'm sorry, I didn't... I... Oh, it's the circular economy and how you feel that might play a role in addressing some of the climate change crises. I don't know. I'm not hearing those first two no, words. It's, it's about this, what's the role of the circular economy, resource we'll productivity. And, yeah. um, I have no good answer for it. I think um, you, you, you laid a lot of stress on energy efficiency, which is one part of resource productivity, and the circular economy looks at resource productivity right across the board from you know, design through to management right through that to the end of That is far too elegant an economic concept for me. I prefer blunt instruments. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. And lady just here, sorry. Um, do you think it would be very useful if we could assign this space in the atmosphere to the different countries so that they were more um, aware of how much more CO2 they could emit? And do you think it's important to develop direct air capture so there's a way that people can compensate for emissions? Uh, uh, yeah, for no, sure? the, the, these are dreadfully complicated issues. I think uh, carbon capture is hopelessly uneconomic um, as currently conceived. There may be a breakthrough. We've actually heard rumors of an uh, enzyme with which you coat the material, the chalky material, which a Caltech scientist referred to as having orders of magnitude improvement. Now, if any ordinary person says orders of magnitude, I interpret it as being a lot. But if a guy from Caltech says it, I interpret it as meaning at least 100 times more efficient. Uh, so we immediately offered to invest in it, and he refused for the first time in my experience. Uh, a university refused to have uh, incremental money uh, uh, donated to research. Uh, so it, it, might be, it might be something really promising. But... Uh, as for measuring everyone's output, I, I think in the end, you're going to have to tax those countries that don't play ball. You're going to have to tax their incoming product for carbon intensity. And you're going to have to calculate that some way. It's not going to be easy. But if you don't do that, then the chain becomes you know, as strong as the weakest link. And in the end, you have to solve that. A broad-based global carbon tax would be good if the UN could get its brain around that one. Just here, please. Uh, Dimitris Angelis from the Grantham Research Institute at the LSC. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I'm also co uh, coordinating lead author for the Global Environment Outlook for the UN, so I will take back your point about downpours and soil erosion and make sure, I'm sure it's been done uh, perfectly well, but I will check to make sure Do it not is. Hold your breath. Well, that's, well, I will certainly take the message back. My question's about pricing. Um, you know, in a world, I mean, you, you showed a the asset portfolio and the exposed uh, pricing seem to be reasonably efficient. Of course, uh, that cuts both ways and it begs a question. 
Um, in a world where if you were to take a strategic forward look and certain sectors simply aren't viable in the kind of environment that you've talked about, if you were to look for you know, interest parity in a portfolio subject to risk and returns, um, those sectors ought to be priced uh, a lot less healthily than they are, and yet they're not. So there seems to be for every person like you and us who talk about the lack of strategic viability for this sector, there is a counterparty who thinks they are a you know, strong, viable, long-term concern. So my question is really this, why is there such mispricing? It's, it seems a little bit kind of, um, you know, I'm uncomfortable with the answer that, oh, well, they're just all very short-termists. That seems a very unsatisfactory no, no, response. It's a good point, they're, they're, but they're operating in, in a, uh, a biased world. In most industries, there is uh, no bias. There's good news, bad news, optimist, pessimist. But in, uniquely in the fossil fuel industry, there is systematically biased output of data. You read the Wall Street Journal religiously, et cetera, et cetera. You do not get a level playing field in terms of the viewpoints issued on the fossil fuel consequences. And in that world, it is not surprising that investors have been a bit slow on the uptake, but that the dangers, they're moving by the way, uh, the dangers are much greater than you think. And uh, what typically happens in these occasions, like going bankrupt, is you do it very slowly, very slowly, and then suddenly all at once. And it always surprises people in the market. Just about the time you give up hope that it will happen, it happens at four times the speed you ever thought. Um, gentleman right at the back there. Hi there. Um, Jamie Palmer, Natural Capital Partners. In response to the US planning to remove himself from the Paris Agreement, we've seen a growth from the voluntary carbon market. I'd just like to get your perspective on if you think the voluntary carbon market has a role to play in decarbonizing the economy. Yeah, I, I see progress on, on all uh, good behavior and, and voluntary actions, um, but I don't see anything like uh, the speed and quantity uh, to get this job done. We will not do this unless basically we're paid to do it, unless the techniques become economic. As I said earlier, if we actually were faced with a situation where the only way to decarbonize was to pay a huge chunk of our GDP, we would not do it. Until the very end, we would scramble when it was too late. Voluntary will not do even a decent fraction of what we have to do. This lady just there at the back. Thank you. Um, Sophia Tickell, do you think that um, it would help if the FDA, FDA were to make um, understanding of climate um, part of their criteria for deciding whether people were fit and proper to actually run the financial markets? And if so, what might that look like? <laughs> God, these questions are getting so complicated. I must, I'm going to have to quit. <laughs> okay. um, Yes, it would help, but how to structure that? It takes knowledge that I don't have, but it would help a lot. 